Hi, I'm Mike Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Iran's nuclear technology and the threat that hovers over all of us. To put it frankly, Iran is being untruthful with their recent announcement proclaiming that they will work together with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, the world's nuclear watchdog, charged with monitoring Iran's nuclear development. If I wanted to be less harsh, I would characterize Iranian leadership as not being totally forthcoming. When Mohammad Eslami, who holds the position of vice president of the head and head of Iran's Atomic Energy Agency, spoke on behalf of Iran's Atomic Energy Organization, he said, and I'm quoting here, the Islamic Republic of Iran is working under the IAEA safeguards, and whenever wants to start new activities, it will cooperate with the IAEA and acts accordingly. Islami statement was provoked by the revelation of renewed evidence that Iran is very close to 90% uranium enrichment. In other words, Iran, the nemesis of the Western world, is nuclear weapons viable, on the threshold of, we would say. Iran's atomic energy head tried to push aside the truth, claiming that all the noise surrounding the country's nuclear capability is generated by Israel, because Israel is frightened. But please don't take their fear seriously, he said. Reports have been made public and have been even published in the Western media attest to the fact that the nuclear facility in Natanz is where the most advanced nuclear production in Iran is taking place. These reports corroborate Israeli political and intelligence leadership that has been shouting about Iran being on the nuclear threshold for several months now. Israel asserts that Iran can, within days, achieve nuclear enrichment levels, 12 days actually, necessary to make an atomic bomb. But they point out, Tehran still lacks the ability to make the weapon itself and also a delivery system, how to deliver it. Overcoming these two obstacles is just a matter of time, though. In order to protect their nuclear labs, Iran has built a complex of tunnels even deeper than the earlier tunnels that they have built, far beneath the ground in the Tans. Reports are that the tunnels are 80 meters or 262 feet deep below the surface. Some estimates are that some of the tunnels could be as deep as 100 meters, 328 feet below the ground. Satellite photos show mounds of dirt piled high over the area. This is particularly worrisome. The GBU-57 bombs are the best bunker buster bombs in today's world. The GBU-57 bombs were specifically designed by the United States for the express purpose of striking this kind of Iranian nuclear facility. The GBU-57 is effective only up to 60 meters, which is 192 feet, which is far shy of the Nunatan's tunnels. And in July 2020, some country, the assumption being Israel, of course, successfully blew up part of Iran's super-secret nuclear lab in the Tans. The operation clearly used human assets to plant, destroy the enrichment operations system, setting back the Islamic Republic of Iran's plans for several years for nuclear development. As an aside, one cannot even imagine the amount of planning required to pull off an operation like that. It damaged the facility, it damaged the hardware, and it did not kill anyone. The operation clearly required a detailed and intricate understanding of the internal operations inside the Natanz nuclear facility. Iran referred to the incident as an accident, as you could probably imagine. Earlier in 2010, Israel, with the help of the U.S., successfully planted Stuxnet, a computer virus that completely shut down and destroyed Iran's nuclear system and forced them to rebuild from the start. Stuxnet made its way from Europe to Asia to Iran. The virus was carried through the Siemens technology systems and probably inserted with a flash drive, simple flash drive. Stuxnet remained dormant until and undetectable until it was activated by Israel. Then it became dormant again afterwards. Over the years, there have been numerous successful operations that have delayed Iran's nuclear development. Some Iranian nuclear sites were so secret they were not even known to the IAEA for inspection. Iran's nuclear sites are arguably some of the most protected 
sites in the world. And now, Iran claims that they are cooperating. It's a ploy. In fact, Iran is already enriching 23 times more uranium than the infamous 2015 nuke deal permitted. But it's not just the level of enrichment that's worrisome. It's the quantity of their fuel. Israeli officials report that Iran currently has enough enriched fuel for 10 weapons. The AFP reports that they saw a confidential IAEA report stating that Iran has far exceeded the agreed limit in their enrichment stockpile of 202.8 kilos, which is 445 pounds. As of May 13, 2023, they collected 4,444 kilos, enough for 10 nuclear bombs. That bolsters the Israeli report. True to form, Iran is not permitting the IAE to reinstall the original monitoring devices. And they are certainly not allowing new devices that the IAEA would like to place in the Tans and in Fordo, which is built inside of a mountain. It's deja vu all over again. A surgical multi-target missile attack by Israel is inevitable. Coming up next, points of view. Continuing on the theme we just spoke about in the background briefing, first up is a column from Ynet that was written by Ron Benishai and was published on June 1st, 2023. The column is entitled, Iran is a threshold nuclear state, but without a weapon yet. Subtitle, analysis, Tehran can already claim success in achieving some strategic goals, including intimidating regional neighbors, who now seek to mend ties, while Israel must understand that without the U.S. support, it would struggle to confront Iran and its proxies in an all-out war. This is how Ram Benishai begins. The report published on Wednesday by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, is indeed serious, but not enough to justify the media panic we're witnessing in recent days. It must be clear, Iran is in reality a nuclear threshold state, and has been for the past two years, but is still far from obtaining a nuclear weapon. This, by the way, is very, very important. For Iran to have a nuclear device that could threaten Israel and other countries, it would need at least one, if not two years, and to cross over the line from a nuclear threshold state to one in possession of a nuclear weapon. Three things are needed. One is dozens of kilos of fissile material, uranium enriched to the level of 90% or higher. Second is a tried and proven mechanism to cause the nuclear explosion. And third is a nuclear warhead and a ballistic or cruise missile or an airplane that can carry such a warhead or a nuclear bomb to a distance of 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles. Benichai's next point is very important, and it's often lost in the panic, and that's why he's writing this. He writes, in practical terms, Iran is not rushing towards nuclear capability. It is taking things slow, but even the process of enriching more and more uranium to levels ranging from 5% to 60% serves Tehran's strategic aims well. Benichai explains that Iran is working to undermine the influence of the United States and Israel in the region. He is convinced that Iran has been more than a little successful at achieving that goal and their goals. He writes, the Iranians are working to obtain nuclear weapons and are risking an Israeli-American military strike in order to pressure Washington, scare regional states, and achieve their strategic objectives without paying a price. Even the IAEA has despaired recently from receiving explanations regarding the remnants of uranium found in three different sites after Israel alerted the IAE about them in 2019. At least in terms of its nuclear program, Iran can claim partial success in achieving its goals. But it still does not possess a nuclear weapon and will not, it seems, for within the next year or more. Israel must remember that and continue its efforts to enlist the participation of the United States. Benny Shai now concludes this way. A year is not long in strategic process, and Israel must know that without a massive assistance of the American military 
at least in the logistics, air refueling capabilities, and more, it would struggle in the confrontation with Iran, which would include war with the Lebanese-based Hezbollah group, the Palestinians, Shiite militia in Iraq, and the Houthis in Yemen. This is an exceptional, excellent analytical piece. Thanks for your insight, as always, Ron Benishai. Sticking with the same theme, of course, next up is a column that was written by Emily Schrader. This column was published on May 24, 2023, and it too ran in Ynet. The column is entitled, Iranian Dissident, Advocate for Israel-Iran Relations Attacked in U.S. Subtitled, Suspicions Mount that the IRGC targeted Ahmed Abali in a violent assault against him and his son in California. Iranian dissident runs a satellite TV network critical of Islamic Republic and also advocates for peaceful relations with Israel and the Jewish community. The subtitle tells the entire story. The column almost is <laughs> irrelevant at this stage, but it's a real shocker that something of this magnitude can happen here in the United States. Iranian agents operating here in the United States, it's unthinkable, but almost absolutely probable. Schrader begins, Ahmed Abali, an Iranian dissident and an advocate for peaceful relations between Israelis and Iranians, operates a satellite TV station from Chicago that broadcasts news which is critical of the regime in Tehran. This week, he and his son were beaten by unknown assailants in California while on their way to Abali's son's law school graduation. Both were hospitalized and are currently in critical condition. Ahmed's son is now fighting for his life. According to his relatives, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, are behind the attack and have spent years harassing and threatening Abali for his activities. Such activity would not be out of the ordinary for the regime in Iran, which previously attempted to kidnap Iranian dissident and journalist Masi Ali Najad from New York. The regime is also known to kidnap or assassinate many others on foreign soil, including Europe and the UAE, and has repeatedly attempted to kidnap Israeli tourists and businessmen in plots that were foiled. Abali is a supporter of Israel and Israel-Iranian relations. Abali has also been outspoken about relations with Israel and with the Jewish community, stating in a prior interview with Ynet, the notion that if you are a Shiite, you are against Jews and against Israel is completely wrong. The notion that all Iranian people are against Israel is even more wrong. I believe that the majority of the Iranian people do not see Israel as an enemy. There is no reason for our people to be an enemy of Israel. Regarding the level of support amongst the Iranians for Israel, Abali said, I can tell you that the majority of Iranian people are pro-Israel. I would estimate that more than 90% of Aziris are pro-Israel. The attacks on journalists and dissidents by the Islamic Republic are actionable escalations by Iran against the US and other Western powers. In her conclusion, Schrader says, point blank, that Iran cannot be trusted, she writes. The entire free real world would do well to take these threats from the regime seriously and act with zero tolerance against the Islamic Republic of Iran, a regime that cannot, under any circumstances, be trusted. I am so glad that Emily Schrader has undertaken to champion this cause and to bring it to our attention. It's very essential. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you eight cartoons today, just cartoons actually. The first cartoon pokes fun at the very large field of Republican candidates vying for the most coveted position in the world and their different perspectives. Many hats are in the ring and each has a different message. Take a look. This next cartoon is a spoof on the International Plastics Treaty, which is supposed to reduce the amount of plastic in the ocean, or oceans, I should say. The cartoon reads, the treaty is in the pipeline, and out of the pipeline spills more and more and more plastic. 
on the same topic of plastics, a woman approaches a fishmonger, someone selling fish, who tells the customer, sorry, we don't have any plastic bags anymore, ma'am. The fish ate them all. This is a very sad truth about their society, unfortunately. These next two cartoons are about Turkey re-electing President Erdogan for yet another five-term year in office. In this cartoon, Erdogan is crushing democracy with a turban. And similarly, the next cartoon is about Erdogan calmly riding on the rough seas of inflation, high cost of living, and the weak lira. Erdogan is comfortably perched on the crescent moon and the star, the symbol of Turkey. And he's holding up a sign which reads, five more years. These last three cartoons are about Russia, Putin, and Ukraine. In this cartoon, the Grim Reaper is Russia, flying alongside drones, jets, and missiles, obviously going to attack Ukraine. There have been drone attacks on both sides of Russia, Ukraine, and the conflict itself. Here we see both leaders depicted as youngsters playing their remotes, but in reality, this is not a game. And this final cartoon is of Putin in his bedroom, sitting on his bed. A huge rain cloud in black called Ukraine is raining over his head. Note the symbolism of his red socks. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. The office of the Israeli Prime Minister asked the many Israeli ministers currently in New York City not to participate in the Salute to Israel parade, making the 75th anniversary of Israel. Netanyahu was reported to have said there is no need for more than one or two representatives of the government. The statement came after about a third of his government, plus additional members of his coalition, traveled to the United States for the parade. Opponents of the government's proposed judicial overhaul made clear that they would demonstrate at the parade and would hound and heckle the ministers during their stay in New York. And from personal experience, I witnessed several participants in the parade being pestered, and I saw Israeli security step in to ward off true conflict with hecklers. <laughs> Member of Knesset Simcha Rothman, who was in New York for the parade, as well as other meetings, was the prime target for the protesters. They shouted, shame, and in Israel, you put fighters in prison and people like you roam freely. We will not let you destroy our country. That's what was being shouted at him. Amichai Chilki, the Israel's Minister of Diaspora Affairs, was another Israeli participating in the parade. During the parade, Chilki was photographed displaying his two middle fingers towards those who were protesting the Israeli government's proposal for judicial overhaul. The Minister of Diaspora Affairs defended himself in a tweet. According to the tweet, he said the gesture he made was for the protesters to smile and not that he was cursing them out. Earlier in the day, protesters had demonstrated against Chikli's outside the offices of the Jewish agency in New York City. Paraguay, President-elect Santiago Peña, said that he intends to move his embassy back to Jerusalem when he takes office. The newly elected president made his intentions clear in a meeting with Israel's ambassador to Paraguay, Ohad Magain. Peña, who was elected in April, made the promise to move the embassy one of his election promises and platforms. After the embassy was first moved to Jerusalem in 2018, then-president Horacio Manela Cortez decided to move it back to Tel Aviv. That decision resulted in outrage in Jerusalem and the closure of the Israeli embassy in Paraguay. Egypt has deployed three tugboats to tow an oil tanker that suffered an engine failure 
in the Suez Canal. The canal's head, Osama Rabi, said traffic heading north will, will resume as normal after the tugboats move the tanker. The crew tanker, C. Vigor, is a Malta-flagged vessel and was built in 2016, so it's pretty new, according to Referton Incan, a shipping data company. According to the Suez Canal Authority, the tanker was heading from Russia to China. Turkish President Erdogan took the oath of office for a new presidential term, extending his rule into a third decade. During his inauguration, Erdogan said, I, as president, swear upon my honor and integrity before the great Turkish nation and the history to safeguard the existence and independence of the state. Turkey's longest serving leader, Erdogan, won 52.2% in the May 28th runoff. His election victory defied most opinion polls and came despite a cost of living increase crisis that many thought would hurt his prospects. This new five-year mandate allows Erdogan to pursue the increasingly authoritarian policies that have polarized the country, a NATO member, but strengthened its position as a regional military power. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke about the decision of the International Atomic Energy Agency to close the investigation against Iran. Netanyahu said, I have a clear message to both Iran and the international community. Israel will do everything she needs to do to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant also addressed the IAEA report, which indicated that Iran possesses sufficient enriched uranium for two nuclear bombs. Gallant's statement was, the threats confronting the state of Israel are escalating and becoming more severe. We may be called upon to fulfill our duty of safeguarding the security of our land. The tasks ahead are arduous and the challenges are significant. The reality we face is intricate, but the state of Israel, the IDF, and all security agencies will be well prepared to ensure Israel's present and future security with the assistance of our current and incoming general staff members. Now for a savory bit of information. The prestigious Pizza Guide Top 50 Pizza has included an Israeli restaurant in its list of the top 50 pizza places in the world. The restaurant, which is located in Jerusalem, was ranked as the best in Israel and one of the 50 best in the world in the Asia Pacific category. This is the first time that a pizzeria in Israel, or for that matter, a kosher pizzeria anywhere, anywhere in the world, has been featured in the guide. The pizza parlor that received the honor is called La Piedra. La Piedra offers a variety of Italian flour pizzas and uses dough that slowly rises for 24 to 36 hours. The restaurant does not only serve pizza. It also serves other Italian dishes and desserts like cannoli. It's, all of its products are prepared on the spot and handmade, and the ranking and the award ceremony of the annual competition was held in Tokyo, Japan. La Piedra placed 38th in the competition. The name of the restaurant La Piedra was chosen as a tribute to Chef Avi Sinclair's mother, who is Argentinian. It means the stone, and it represents the heart of the pizzeria, which uses a stone, taboon, to prepare its delicious and now award-winning pizzas. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, tell me what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that there are a lot of many interesting facts about Iran? We speak about Iran quite a bit, and it's worth knowing more about who they are and where they come from. And one of the most interesting facts is that Iran is not really the official name of this country that has a 6,000-year-old history and culture, 6,000 years. For thousands of years, the country was known as Persia. In 1935, it became Iran. The official name today of the country is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran is actually a very old reference, a reference, by the way, that's connected linguistically to the word Aryan. And the official language of the country is Persian or Farsi. 
Iran is a very large country. It's the 17th largest country in the world. It's also the 17th largest in population with 85 million citizens. Iran has a turbulent history though. In 550 before the Common Era BCE, it was one of the great empires under Cyrus. Cyrus the Great, uniting Mesopotamia, Egypt, and India under one government. Years later, under Darius, Persia stretched from Bulgaria and Romania through India and south all the way to Egypt. In 330 BCE, Alexander the Great conquered Persia. In 660 CE, the Arabs conquered it. And in 1220 CE, it was conquered by none other than Genghis Khan. Should you find yourself in Iran today, never give a thumbs up sign. In Iran, that's an insult, similar to the middle finger here in the United States. But if you want a nose job, Iran is the place. It's considered one of the nose job capitals of the world, with surgeons performing 300,000 rhinoplasties nose jobs every year. Polo was created in Iran, not for a sport of elites, but rather to train warriors on horseback. Iran has the largest producers of saffron in the world. 90% of the world's saffron comes from Iran. Saffron is more expensive than gold. It sells for over $70 per gram. I hope that you now have a new appreciation for Persia and Iran's history and culture. It's an ancient society, but by no means is it a backwards society. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.